there's a lot of suffering <laughs> involved. I mean, we're not going to say it's all, all fun. Then I realized to, to, to break the ice and I got some more oxygen and then my brain started to work again. And it was my first 8,000. And you learn. <laughs> Luckily, you learn a lot of things about yourself. I thought about it a lot because the first time I went there, I had kind of this very big discussion with myself about dying. So there's the ice fall, which is really scary. It's a really scary place. Those who say not, it's not it, they're lying. So you see, like the Milky Way is like nowhere else. And it's beautiful. I am Tommy and this is Surfer of Life. My guest today is an adventurer and mountaineer Mia Greffe. Mountain and nature is your passion and you enjoy being present in the archipelago, hiking tracks in Finnish Lapland and of course up in the mountain territories. You grave for physical and mental challenges and hard workout. You have reached the summit in various mountains, which include three of the 14th 8000ers, Lotse, Chooyu, and the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. Mia Greffe, warm welcome to Surfer of Life. Thank you very much. <laughs> when was the last time you played swamp soccer? Swamp soccer. Oh yes, that was a few years back. <laughs> that was an interesting sport. <laughs> I was in a swamp in Finland and it was really cold. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was with my couple of friends. We had this get together. Okay. And we played the swamp soccer. <laughs> I get the invitation once myself. Mm. I believe it's World Championships. Okay. So cold. I or maybe it was some kind of other tournament or was it just for fun? It was just for fun, yeah. Okay. I could hardly get my leg up from the swamp. It was really deep. So <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna participate in the world championship. <laughs> I get a once invitation myself for that world championship, as they always call these crazy cr crazy events in Finland, but I kind of skipped it, so I don't know why, but you haven't it's, participated in the one that throw your wife. No. no. <laughs> or was it throw your phone and carry your wife? <laughs> Something like that, I think. Some crazy atmosphere in, up in Lapland. Mm -hmm. uh, you really love, love to be in the nature, I suppose. Yes. So what has been your spark to nature? What was the beginning for this? I think it was the summers in the archipelago. I spent all my summers there with the water, uh, almost on the water, in the water. <laughs> I think I think most of the Finns have the nature is very close, but as I work indoors, I work in the airplane, so I feel uh, like a very strong urge for the nature when I get out. So I, I can feel it when I, I have to exercise, like today I had to go to the gym, so I don't like that. I don't like to exercise indoors, I like to exercise outdoors. It's good to breathe mm. some oxygen. Oh yes, it is. <laughs> Finland is quite a flat country, and mountains are something totally different. At some point you went for mountaineering. How did that happen? I think it was because I'm not a beach person, this is funny. And my work took me a lot to the Canary Islands and all over the world, where I, there's a lot of beaches. The rest of the crew was staying at the beach, but I started to wander up in the mountains and, and Madeira and and um, Gran Canaria, Tenerife, and these places, and I, I really enjoyed it. I, I felt it was, like, really nice. And then I started to look for more. This is, I guess, how it started. And then I'd done a lot of trekking. I like trekking in the mountains. And then I just started to trek higher up, higher up, uh, until I, I ended up on, on Cotabax, which is in, in Ecuador. That was my first 6,000 meters. That was kind of an accident. I just went on a holiday trip, and, and there was... <laughs> you could climb the mountain. I thought, okay, why not? And then I, I realized I was really good at it. <laughs> and of course, you like to do things you're really good at. <laughs> For sure. Accidentally mm. in 6,000 meters. No, accident, <laughs> accident. There was a hiking trip. I was really interested in the hiking trip. It was like a hiking trip in the high mountains in Ecuador. And then it just ended in this climb. I thought like, well, why not? After that, you continue then. There was this mm. um, some kind of charity project, Kapua. Can yes. you tell me about that? 
Yes, it raises money for uh, children. And uh, we took part uh, that year. We took part by by um, climbing the mountain. We raised money from friends and <laughs> enemies or <laughs> anybody to to take part in the project uh, for save uh, save the children, rewrite the future. Uh, which actually the money we raised, they built 14 schools for kids in Nepal, which was uh, very rewarding. Like you got the trip and you got all these people you got got to know, and then you raised this money for charity, which is it's rewarding in itself. Everybody should try it. Yeah, it sounds very <laughs> mm. rewarding. Uh, mm. What about Nepal? You've been there many times. How about Nepal? What is there that takes you to Nepal? Is it only the mountains or is it something else? Oh, well? no, no. Mountaineering is not just about the mountains. <laughs> it's pretty much about the people. Of course, this was my first trip. And I, I, when we were taking part in this project, we got to see the children. We got to go up to the mountain villages where they build these schools. So I got a really close look at the Nepali people as well. And there, there is a certain spirit we don't have in the Western world. I think I know everybody talks about this but they have this kind of joy in their everyday life that we we're missing in a way and i thought it was really fascinating and this same kind of joy i i met with the sherpa people that we climb with they have this you could say it's part of the buddhist way of thinking but i think it has to do with the mountain as well they're um, they're familiar with hardship they're familiar with not having so much the environment is really hard but it, it it makes them kind of living the moment, and they're very grateful for small things, and they have um, they have this certain attitude that when they help somebody, when they uh, make somebody else excel, that's kind of rewarding for them in itself, which is kind of interesting. And I think that's why why the Sherpas like to to work the way they do because they do very hard work. Yeah, I understand. They do that. get paid for it then, and of course they, they school their children and this. But I think it's part of their way of thinking. Okay, yeah. you fell in love with the mountains when you were mm. in a working trip. Mm. What was the first thing? What was the thing that you enjoyed being up there in the mountains, up in six thousand meters, for example? You can see very far. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> not just like <laughs> geographically you can see very far in yourself as well because it's an effort as i said i I like to kind of it's not the same if you go with a helicopter and land on a mountain it's mm-hmm. not the same it's when you have to do this effort to get somewhere that's the point the price is there then yeah kind of uh, you could say that they say that it makes people feel so good they even use it for for people who has planned suicide and it's their training. They have a center in, in Austria where they, they take people up on the mountain and somebody who has climbed the mountain would not j- jump off the mountain. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, there's something mm-hmm. about the mountains. I've always mm-hmm. wondered because I think there's a lot of, well, Buddhist, probably Hinduism, mm-hmm. but these temples and the spirituality up in the mountains, so mm. there must be something mythic about the mountains. I do snowboarding myself, but I take <laughs> the ski lift, to be honest. <laughs> Sorry about that. But still, I kind of, and I haven't been that high mm. up, over 3,000 mm. by ski lift. Mm. But there, when you see these big drops and huge mountains, in my eyes, mm. kind of, I like the atmosphere, I like the spirit. Of course, it's different than the climbing, but... Still, maybe next time you take a split board and you skin up, and then we know about the reward. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I've heard about it, I've I've been asked many times. (laughs) Maybe one day. Uh, I read an article you told there that you are actually very good after 7,000 meters, Mm that you feel very good up there. Do you have any explanation for that? No, it's kind of true, it's just something I experienced because. Uh, of course, most of the time I climb with men. That's and men who are younger than I am. <laughs> so they have they are physically more fit than I am. They are faster. But it's funny when you have less air, it doesn't help. It's it works the opposite way, because muscles need a lot of oxygen, and if you go fast, then it usually catch up in like a few hours. The the lack of oxygen. So I, I'm usually slower in the in the beginning, 
But it's easy. Being a woman, you can be the weak one. Ah. <laughs> you don't have to be the alpha one going first. <laughs> and uh, then I usually catch up with them. About Usually it's about 7,000 meters. I kind of catch up and then I... It was on Everest. It's been on other expeditions as well. And um, I don't know if it has to do with that being a female because I've seen it in, in, in other female climbers as well. So I don't know why, but... This is just the way it is. <laughs> you told me that usually they go first and you you reach them at some point. Mm. Uh, it's it's still that it's a team sport, right? You have this group, but mm. still you are individuals. So yes. somebody might go first and somebody stays behind. How does yeah. this work? On these like 8,000 meter peaks, like it's trekking. The first parts, like the first weeks are trekking. So we don't have to, to kind of climb together. Like okay. like one team, it's not necessary. It just everybody should do it in their own pace. So we are not like for safety. We're not dependent on each other. So that's why I usually and it's not like I'm lacking behind. Like hours, I do see them, but yeah. because we're walking, we're trekking. Uh, it's different when you go like mountaineering style. That we are in the same rope, roping up. That's different then. But these big mountains, we go like individuals, like. But still, as when you're talking about the team, we still have to support each other as a team. And that's more like mental support that you get from your team base. Because we are there for months. We are there for two months when we go climbing. And, and people have weak days. They have strong days. And usually in a team, we can then compensate each other. So that's why the team is important. Yeah. You enjoy your view behind. You can take it easy. You don't have yeah. to talk to anybody. Else. <laughs> not true. Not true. <laughs> 2012, you reached your first over 8,000 meter summit. That's correct. How did that feel? It felt great because I was, I, uh, I did a lot of work, a lot of work for that. And um, I don't know, when you're up there, you know it's only halfway. That's like mountaineering snow, that's the summit is only halfway. Yeah. Most people die on the way down if they're going to die or something happens on the way down. So when you reach the summit, it's like, yeah, this is what I'm work for. But you still know like there's so much that can still happen going down. So it's not like we pop the champagne cork or like celebrate. We do congratulate each other on the summit and we're like, oh, yes. But we know that the way down is the important thing. So <laughs> I don't know. I've thought about it a lot, what it felt up out there. But I remember that I was I was tired. And then I remember looking at, because Lotse is like the south summit of Everest, in a way. You can see Everest. But it's it looks so different from any pictures, because most pictures are taken from, like, down below. So I, I remember looking at it like... Well, that's a funny mountain over there. <laughs> what could that be? <laughs> because you're l lacking in oxygen up there, like yeah. like a lot. <laughs> and you have all these funny thoughts like, hmm, what's over there? <laughs> what's happening now? <laughs> and we, we didn't have that much time. It was really windy. I mean, it was a storm going on. We didn't know that, that at the same time there were 10 people died on Everest. And... Uh, because the storm didn't affect us, it was coming from behind. But it was really windy on the summit, so we didn't spend much time there. We took the, the pictures, of course, the selfies, <laughs> the most important things. And then we just started descending. And because um, there was another point too, uh, just be below the summit, there was uh, a body, which we didn't know about. And then he was a, it was a new body. He was just deceased, probably like 10 hours before. It was a, a, a young Czech boy. Mm -hmm. who had climbed there uh, without oxygen and without climbing partners. The others had turned around. But we didn't know this because they never told us. So that was kind of, a, you see that first, and then you see like, mm, okay, we're going to climb to the summit. We did give him like respect. We didn't take any pictures, yeah. which in hindsight we should have done for the insurance company. Okay. But it was enough that we told them about him. Okay. So you can guess on the summit we were like, okay, mixed feelings. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> this is. Uh, I want to ask you about this a little bit more <laughs> later, when you meet these climbers <laughs> who you never reached the top <laughs> or didn't go down. Most of them down did, back to but the, they didn't yeah. get home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
8,516 meters mm. was Lotse. Mm. And you already said about after 7,000 mm. meters, the oxygen, the breathing is heavier. Mm. And you said that this boy was without the yeah, extra oxygen. We were oxygen. using like... You are using oxygen. So, yeah, I, we were using supplementary oxygen, oxygen after 8,000 meters, uh, but he was climbing without, yeah. But still the breathing must be pretty difficult and hard. Do you practice that? Have you practiced breathing methods, techniques before you go up there? I, I use it like, well, yes, I do. <laughs> I use the kind of uh, breathing you use in, in, uh, in yoga. It's easier for me to, to do the like exhaling when I do, do like, when I feel really tired. I concentrate on my breathing, so it feels like so it's it's even and it's deep because I know that I, if you start to do like really just with the upper parts of your lungs the breathing you don't get enough oxygen because there's already less oxygen and the supplementary os- oxygen is not hundred percent it's not like fighter pilots <laughs> yeah. so you just get like half liter a liter a minute and you mix that with the oxygen in the air so yes you get a lot of Less oxygen than that we have in, at home when you do the exercise. But it still, it helps with your your blood flow so you don't feel so cold. That's one of the main points why I use it. I don't want to lose my fingers or my toes or nose or ears. I still need them. So when you use supplementary oxygen, you have a much higher chance not to get frostbite. Okay. And there's something about descending with the supplementary oxygen mm. that you need to come to a certain level down below enough after reaching the summit. How no, does that go? No. no. Okay. Um, you can stop using it anytime. It's not like divers. Okay. It's not the same. But usually you should have it going down because I mean above eight thousand meters there is I mean there is oxygen, we all know that. But the pressure is so much lower, so it's hard to use the oxygen that is in the air. The human body doesn't cope well with that. So it starts to de- deteriorating after 8,000 meters. It doesn't recover anymore. So if you do a lot of exercise, you would not recover from that. What is so difficult and hard about the descending that people actually, they reach the summit, but then they never get back down? They're exhausted. Their lack of... Uh, Liquids we don't carry. You don't. You can't make any food up there. Mm. <laughs> like you have snacks in your pockets, but you you don't drink that much. But ex- exhaustion is one of the biggest why people die. You know, when you get hungry at sea level, you get cold, mm. so you can get cold up there as well. Mm. And we're talking about like summit efforts of 25, 26 hours, up to thirty six hours. Some people do it for forty eight hours. So you must imagine they're exhausted and it's very cold and then the lack of oxygen. So. Yeah, and then people do mistakes when they get ex- tired. And it feels mm-hmm. also heavier to just come down in a smaller slope if you just go yes. down. It's heavier <laughs> for the legs, especially yeah. when you have climbed up already. Yeah, so. usually exhaustion or then people just fall to their death. That's two kind of main points how people die. What uh, you consider has been your most difficult challenge? Am I yes, correct? Yes, yes. What made it so difficult? It's a technical route. It's and it goes through the the ice fall. It's the same route in the beginning as uh, the Everest if you climb it from south. Okay. So there's the ice fall, which is really scary. It's a really scary place. Those who say not, it's not it. They're lying because it's a really scary place. There's shifting ice blocks all the way, all the time, and and. Um, the two last accidents, really big ones, happened there. But that was a big because of the earthquake, and then a big chunk of ice fell down in the icefall. But still, the icefall is is moving all the time, and you have to go over these very scary ladders, and everything is kind of well, very volatile. You don't know what's going to happen, so you, you just pray like to any god. It doesn't matter that please let me go through safe. And I remember the last time I crossed it, when I came down, I was like, I promised myself I would never, ever set foot in that ice fall again. <laughs> I've been seeing mm. these um, documentaries, Sherpa, mm. which was mm. 
quite sad to be honest because mm. a lot of people got killed. Mm. But there I saw this they had these GoPro cameras or some action cameras in their helmets and they were putting those ladders and I was thinking like why on earth and how can you step on that mm. ladder when there's a drop like I don't know how many kilometer, mm. kilometers down and you've done it. I've done it and I have vertigo, so <laughs> but yeah. you get used to everything like <laughs> and the first time we practice we don't have them the fall in between. But you just have to put the spikes on, on like both sides of the ladder and it's it's really scary, but then you just get used to it. I like in in the end we just kind of kept running over the ladders. Okay. It was like you yeah. You get used. It's it's not as scary as it looks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> but it was scary. The ladders was not the scary part. The, land, the scary part was to be in the ice fall. Okay, so which back to your question. That's why I think it was was one of the hardest. And then the climb is very technical, which was a lot of fun. It was really challenging, but and it was my first eight thousand. And you learn. <laughs> Luckily, you learn a lot of things about yourself, how you work. So yeah. People are very disappointed that I didn't find Everest as hard. Because yeah. you should, because it's higher. But it's, it's, everything just went so smooth for me on Everest. I wasn't sick. I didn't experience any setbacks in any part of the acclimatization or anything. It was like, it was so smooth. <laughs> That's good. Mm. And it's funny that people are disappointed. Yeah. It's you yeah. that this experience in the mountains <laughs> and climbing up there is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but who ever heard about lots of like they're like okay but Everest everybody knows what Everest is yes, that's why <laughs> that is correct <laughs> I went today I went to virtual reality so I was actually reaching the summit of mm. Everest and mm. I saw lots of from mm. there I don't know mm. I wonder if it looks like that but Probably I does, saw yeah. I saw the view and it's virtual reality so it's mm. no reality at all but it looked amazing still and I got butterflies in my stomach <laughs> even though I was standing on a solid ground mm. here in the mm. flat planet earth mm. it's amazing uh, tell me about blue eyes what is so difficult about what, what about blue eyes what it's really so? blue eyes is yeah. really hard it's really hard it's really hard to get your spikes in it's really hard to get your eyes in actually in, in the blue eyes because it, it's it's I think it's you know I know it's it's formed like over a under a lot of pressure and the, the environment is just so harsh up in the Himalayas so they have blue eyes we don't form blue eyes in, in Finland no. I do ice climbing in Finland as well but the ice is it's much softer it's more like we call it chewing gum your ice axe will actually kind of very nicely go in yeah. but this blue eyes you hit your ice axe and it goes like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so that's kind of scary when your spikes don't hold on the ice what is the biggest uh, longest vertical route you've done and how long did it take that uh, ice climbing or mountain. ice climbing yeah sorry ice, ice climbing, climbing I'm, I'm not that good at ice climber i think it must have been in Korowama, probably is mm. it is 25 25 30 meters maybe yeah what about in mountaineering? What about in Lhotse or Mount Everest? Or mm, yeah, we don't else? actually do like ice climbing in that way. We, we climb the face, yeah. which which is then like 500 meters, 600 meters. But it's not just solid blue ice. We have then snow as well on the route. So it's not the same. And then we use the fixed ropes, which makes it different. Because if you do ice climbing, it's like vertical like this. Yeah. But the mountain will be like 45 degrees maybe max 50, 50 degrees going up we don't i don't think we had any part that was like going more than 50 degrees <laughs> but it's, it's still very steep no, that's very steep yeah <laughs> how long has been the longest part of you climbing all together this 50 to 40 no it was the degrees. summit night on, on lots definitely yeah that was going like up 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 <laughs> So I like these mountains where you actually go up, 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 <laughs> because you can you can feel your like mountains should look like this, like <laughs> like a cone. And <laughs> if they look like this, that's well, not so. <laughs> it's not so motivating. Like, or especially if you have to go down and then go up again, that's like that's not fun. <laughs> so I guess after lots, you were hooked because then you continued. And this mm, next mm. over 8,000er mm. was Chooya. No, Chooya was before. 
I was in, no, yeah. I have yeah. to do my yeah, homework no, Charlie, better. No, no Charlie, it was, it was before, yeah. Was that it? was my practice, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought lots of us here first. No, lots of, lots of, no, no. Damn me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I climbed like uh, Choyu, I was climbing Choyu, and then I climbed uh, Mera Peak and Barunce, which they're not 8,000 meter peaks, but Barunce is 7,000 meter peaks, which is pretty much okay. yeah. very close. It's a big expedition. And then I felt really comfortable to climb lots. Of <laughs> okay. What lots about Choya? It's Choya. over 8,000, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. The, it's the sixth no, sixth highest mountain in the world. Yeah. That was my, like, <laughs> I had to pay my dues <laughs> for training. That was a hard one. <laughs> okay. Tell yeah, me about yeah. that then. Yeah. Yes, that was my my first like that was an interesting expedition because if you remember the ash coming down in Europe from yes, Iceland, yes, I do yeah, remember. They paid, yeah, I was I was supposed to leave for for New Delhi, and there was no flights because everything was cancelled. Then uh, then I had to find a way to get to Nepal, which was not easy, and I, my whole family chipped in to try to get me away. And then finally, I got a special permit from the embassy, the, the Russian embassy. I went up to them and told them, like, I have to go and climb to you. <laughs> and they understood. And I got a special visa for Russia and I jumped on the train to Moscow. But it wasn't sure that the planes were flying from Moscow either. So I had a plan B to take the train through Trans-Siberia to, to Beijing and then fly into Lhasa and then go the other way because I was climbing to you from Tibet, from China. Okay. But then, luckily, I did get fly into Delhi and did get fly into Kathmandu. And at the airport, they told me, like, there's going to be, a, like, a national strike. So we need to take you to the embassy to get your visa for Tibet. And then we need to hit the border. I was like, okay. <laughs> I didn't have time. I just had time to get some snacks and stuff. And then we hit the border. And on the way to the border, this is, I mean, this is times when the Maos were still active. In the countryside. I mean, we had to remember that they had a civil war there. And it's the third word. So we were stopped by the Maos on the way or whatever. Wow. Some kind. They put fires on the road and we couldn't pass. And and then they knew it like they sent these old ladies to talk with them because they were... I mean, these guys were using drugs. And But we drank tea with them for a few hours. And then when the sun rise, the, the army was out on the road. So we did get to cross the border. So... Yeah, sometimes it's more difficult to get to the mountain than actually climb the mountain. <laughs> so this is part of the, you said I'm an adventurer, yeah. Uh, I, I think I'm an adventurer junkie in that way. <laughs> I believe so, yeah. it's what a because, journey. <laughs> because these expeditions, it's not just like the exercise of climbing the mountain, it's a lot of things around that you get to experience. And nothing ever, never usually goes very smoothly, except my Everest climb. <laughs> <laughs> That was quite smooth. <laughs> so you get all these big adventures, and you have to be prepared for that. Though. Well, I think not everybody is prepared to like face all these things, but I think they are exciting. You get like something more, and, and then um, I didn't actually summit to show you. I did. I did get very far, but I then got. To, uh, I had problem with the food. I didn't get enough energy and uh, in, uh, enough liquid, and, and I have to stay behind when the. One from the team we were four in the beginning did get go to the the summit. Okay, Alex did summit then, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going back to that mountain. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> sounds like yeah. sounds like that. It was a big of a big mm. effort to go there. But I think it mm. made made me a better mountaineer. Okay. I think everything I know today I learned on that mountain. <laughs> yeah. So it was a good trip. Yeah. <laughs> you could say that. What about you have to really listen mm. to yourself and your body? Mm. Like you said, you mm. didn't summit the mountain up. Mm. You were very close. Mm. Is it a difficult decision to make that you see? Maybe you mm. already see it, that mm. there it is, mm. but now I need to go down. Mm. How do you make that decision? It's a very, very difficult decision. And especially if it's your first, I mean, mountain, you mm. don't know what it feels like. You don't know when, where you're gonna die or where you're not gonna die. I mean, you don't, you just feel like really bad. And, um, that's kind of puts mountaineering apart as a sport from, from other sports. If you think that you're, you're running a marathon or a ultra marathon or something like that, you can, you can like say like, now I had enough. Now I, I can't move anymore. And somebody's gonna come and kind of save you somehow. They're not gonna leave you to die there. It's like, <laughs> 
that's not going to happen. But up on a mountain, you always have to have a reserve. You can, you can never push yourself to the limit, so to say. You always have to take yourself down. You can never, ever depend on that somebody else is going to kind of collect you and take you down. So those people, when people die on the mountain, there's a lot of talk about like who's responsible and they should have done that. And why didn't they save her or him or whatever? Yeah. I think that's like, no, everybody is responsible to take this self down. I mean, that's what we do on the mountains. You can never like put, pull yourself, put, pull yourself so much to the limit that you can't take your, yourself down. So you have to know your limit, which is very hard in the beginning to know like, Where's my limit? Because I had to go down by myself when, when the others continued for the summit. It's not like I told them, like, okay, guys, <laughs> I don't feel so good. You need to go down with me. That's not going to happen. <laughs> so I knew I had to have enough resources to get down to get myself safe. And that's, that's really, really hard to make these decisions. Because it's, it, the same rules don't apply that applies down here. <laughs> and that's kind of difficult for people to understand when there's accidents up on the mountain like it's not the same ethical rules that we have because <laughs> yeah. if you yeah, get yeah. yourself up you have to get yourself down <laughs> that is true how difficult was that mm. coming down by yourself it was really 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 hard I mean I was so disappointed I did. It, it was my first I had a lot of expectations for myself so it took a while for me like mentally to get rid of all that But then I was so much stronger after that. I mean, eventually they did come come down, and I was really happy for them for their summit because it was Alex's first summit, and he he did it without so supplementary oxygen, which was really a big thing for him. He was a very young boy at that time, and I was really happy for him. But at the same time, I was really sad for myself because I didn't reach my goal. I remember I was really upset at that time, but. Later on, I understood that like it was a really good decision. It was a very wise one, and I'm a much better climber because I did it. It takes a lot of courage, courage mm-hmm. to go go up mm-hmm. there. What do you think about the word courage as a mountaineer? What mm-hmm. does it actually include? Courage means to be like very wise, <laughs> and it it means to like be able to do really hard decisions. It doesn't mean that you're the first on the summit or the fastest or the one doing the bravest things. Mm. On the summit, it means means to like be able to take care of yourself and, if possible, other people as well, and to do hard decisions. That's I think that yeah. really demands mm. courage mm. to step down from uh, reaching your goal mm-hmm. su- and reaching the mm. summit and mm. going back down. And especially those people who have a kind of didn't go for the summit because they saved somebody else's lives. That takes a lot of courage as well, because at the same time, they um, they don't only only save the, the the other person as well. They gave up their own summit bid as well, but they also put themselves at risk because if you're saving somebody else, you put yourself in big danger as well. How many times? They are really trying to save the people, uh, the bodies mm-hmm. from the mountains, or is it just too difficult? Now Often, you mean like we can't really yeah. save the bodies anymore? They are gone. <laughs> yeah, bodies, but uh, <laughs> just are they move trying, about yeah, yeah, move. Are they trying to move them down, back down? Often? If they're in, if they're in a diff- it depends on where they are on the route. Yeah. Because you can't just lower them down. It's and most of the times it's it puts the, the people who try to move them in, in too much danger. So I think that's very acceptable to leave them up there. But a lot of times I do understand the family who wants their the bodies home. And I had a friend who died a few years back on the, on the South Summit after summiting Everest. He just died in his tent and his family wanted his body down and it's possible to take down from. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of sher- strong Sherpas to do it, but they did it and that's fine. It's Of course, it's it's... It's littering as well on the mountain because if you get too many bodies up there, it's, it's yeah. going to be a big problem. Yeah. Was it easy for you to get over that idea that there are bodies on the way and you see people who who are frozen there on the hanging on the ropes, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and this is something that might happen to you? How do you get that mindset that you're just uh, kind of accepting it? I guess mm. I do get these questions a lot. I am. Um, 
I thought about it a lot because the first time I went there, I had a, kind of this very big discussion with myself about dying. Right? What is death? What, mm. Is it possible? The risk, risk assessment. And I think it's really important to do that at home. You, I don't think you do it uh, there. When you once you're there, you have to have a mindset like, okay, if this would happen, or this would happen, or this would happen. It might have something to do with my training as a flight attendant, because when I was like 21, I got this training like, girl, remember one day you're gonna walk in fire, like burning fire, so be prepared. So it might have something to do with that. I thought about it a lot. So I'm I'm prepared every time I go to work. I'm prepared to die in a way. That's my mindset when I go to work. So maybe it's not, not so that difficult to move that mindset to the mountaineering. I thought, okay, I want to do this. This makes me happy. This gives me like meaning to my life. So I'm ready to take this risk. And if, if it's going to happen, I'm fine with that. Yeah. So I have this mindset that I've been to expedition where people have died. There's been accidents. I still didn't go home. I didn't like finish my I know a lot of people did or quit in the middle because they, they got too scared because they, but because I had this mindset from the beginning when I started from home, like, okay, I'm fine with this risk. I know the risks that might happen. I mean, it's anything can happen. So I think that's, I have it very clear in my own mind. And I, I do realize it's, 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 it's easy for me to think like, Okay, my own death is easy to accept. It's my death. It's not easy for my family to accept the same. And it's so much harder to make, like, be accepting that your loved ones is going to die. And that's always been a problem for me when I leave. But it's very physically demanding to climb up mm-hmm. there. But it's also, as you said mm-hmm. already, mm-hmm. it's mentally very challenging. Mm-hmm. Which one is more important? The mindset, the mentality, or the physical, or do they go hand in hand? They go hand in hand, but I think the mental is, is the more important because I've seen like very strong people quit because they couldn't handle the risk. Like I climbed Everest from the north, which the first point where there is some kind of scary part is going up to the north coal. There might be avalanches. It's it's quite a steep climb. So we had very one very strong climber who was very determined on, on climbing. And after the first climb, he said, like, he can't take this risk. He, he has children at home. And I thought, like, mm, well, it's kind of funny to think about it now. Like, he put this so much money on all this effort. And now he remembered he has kids at home. Like, I don't think he thought it through before coming there. So I don't think he had the right mindset. And then you have to have this very strong urge to do it because you have to there's a lot of suffering <laughs> involved. I mean, we're not going to say it's all, all fun because there's like, you're going to be sick and you're going to feel sick and you're going to be tired and you're going to be pissed and you're going to be everything on the way. So, so for doing it, you really need to have like an inner fire, like to do it like a very strong one. Yeah. I have a couple of words for you that, mm-hmm. uh, how would you put these in order when thinking about mountaineering? Mm-hmm. Courage? Mental strength, physical strength, planning, wisdom. Well, courage and wisdom mm. was pretty much in the same level, though. Yeah, courage and wisdom. I think you have to... Mental strength is the first. Like, if you have that, you are almost on the summit. <laughs> and then you have to have courage and the wisdom. And, yeah, physical, you need to have a very physical... But as I said, it comes like way far down what else did you have that <laughs> that's it okay. planning was there too yeah planning is important but it's probably the last one from all this what do you need to consider when mm. you are planning this mm. kind of mm. trip yeah. you said it, mm. there's a lot of different things around it mm. I think at least how I, I do it I, I start with a mindset like what do I want to climb then I get the idea, like, how to climb it. Like, am I able to climb it? Like, I put myself, like, in the mental game, like, climbing the mountain already, like, feeling, like, okay, how am I going to do it? I break it down in small parts, always. Like, okay, getting to base camp, going from camp one to camp two, doing that. Is this, like, possible for me? 
is it feasible? And then I start doing like, okay, do I get time off from work? How about the, the budget? Do I have the money? Can I raise the money? Well, how is that going to work? And when I get these fixed, it's pretty much like go. <laughs> I do. Well, on the first trips, I consulted a lot of these, like Samuli Manzika was one of my mentors. I, very much. He's helped me a lot with a lot of things. He was always helpful. So I try to be helpful with everybody who asks me about anything. I love to help people who go climbing. I think it's so much fun. And um, then I read a lot. I read so many books about mountaineering, which gives you, inspires you, but it also helps you to plan and like focus on, on things, the right things, I hope. And uh, then I usually... Yeah, the, the planning in, in the, the actual climb, like the logistic and things that the, the, you usually buy from a company in Nepal. And I use the same company so I know what they're doing. And that's the easy part. They know how many potatoes or onions you need, <laughs> how much like for liquid or this, this part. I don't have to think about that. I guess the locals are really, really important when reaching the summit. They are. Would it be possible without them? No. Even like best climbers in the world like Olistek or somebody they need the Sherpas to do like the groundwork do you think yeah. they get enough respect in our point of view who doesn't know about mm-hmm. mountaineering from real mountaineering mountaineers <laughs> they get a lot of I mean real mountaineers who are not just customers yeah. who really think and, <clears throat> and know about the mountains their demands they get a lot of respect they do Is there a lot of customers? It's I've mm. seen pictures mm. of Mount Everest that it, there's mm. a huge mm. line mm. going there, like hundreds mm. of people. Mm. I, I don't think they all can be real mountaineers. Am I correct here? Yeah, Everest is is very different from the other eight thousand meter or seven thousand meter peaks or any peak in the world because it's the highest. And there is a lot of people who just want to do this one thing, cl- just climb Mount Everest and. Personally, I don't consider them mountaineers. They do climb. I don't. They do the effort. It's not like somebody's going to carry them up there. It's not mm-hmm. that. But I don't think they've done the groundwork, and they are not responsible enough. On the other hand, you can you can buy your responsibility in a way. Like you, you pay enough sherpas to do. Like they climb a very safe climb because they have like four to six people taking care of them. So they make it safe with money in that yeah. way so they have this people seeing that nothing's gonna everything's gonna work you have enough food you have enough drinks you have and they do climb the mountain i'm not gonna take that away from them but that's all they do they never climb a mo- another mountain again and that's maybe why we call them like customer <laughs> customers or whatever because on, on on mount everest it's like what you pay for you get the more you pay the more you get The less you pay, the less you get. <laughs> so you can imagine my budget is not very big, so I don't get very much. <laughs> well, your budget is not very big because mm. you don't make a big hassle out of climbing to the mountains. That's mm. what I've understood, mm. that mm. some of these customers, or maybe some mm. mountaineers as mm. well, they mm. make a big noise mm. out of, I'm going to climb to the mm. Everest, I'm going to mm. climb somewhere else. Mm. But you are not the person like that, am I right? Yes, you're right. But, It has a lot to do if you have sponsors, you have to do a big noise because the sponsors want to be seen. It's like it works yeah. like this. <laughs> I think it's in all, all like culture, sports, whatever. And uh, I realized when I started out, I was a lot of people told me like, yes, yes, mountaineers always get sponsored. No, that's not the way it is. Veika did get because he was the first, and he did he did work like you can do it in. in I had my work so. To, to be able to like raise sponsors and then it's no free money. So you had to work for that as well and do my work and do my training and climbing. That was not possible. It was mm. not going to work. So then I decided like, okay, I'm going to do my work. I'm going to do my training. I do my climbing and I'm going to pay myself. So that was my choice. I could have chosen to leave my work and then just raise money, try to raise money. I don't know if it's mm. going to happen, yeah. but And then climb my mountains. But this was my choice. And that's why I don't have to make a lot of noise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I understand. Yeah. yeah, I didn't see any sponsor size when I saw photos of you no. up in the summit. Mm-hmm. I just saw a postcard and yeah. a little Finnish flag. Yeah. 
<laughs> so it's not because I don't want to have sponsors like they wrote in Helsinki Sanomat. It's because I just don't have the time. If somebody would offer me like, okay, here's the money, go and climb mountains, I would be very happy. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's talk about the mountains mm. a little bit more. And what what do you think are the biggest risk factors up there when you're reaching the summit? Ooh, the biggest on the mountain. There are so many of them. It depends on the route. The route is first, like, are they, like, usually we try to, when we climb a mountain, we try, of course, to get the low-risk route. But on a lot of mountains, like Lotse and Everest south side, you cannot, there's no safe route through the icefall. Then you have to do this risk assessment. Am I ready to take this? So the, how you place the route is is probably one of the biggest ones. Okay. And... Um, But as I said, you can't always like get a final safe route. Then we try to, to climb in a safe way, which means climbing during when it's stable. So that meant during the night we had like wake up two o'clock. We left at three o'clock after porridge and all this. And then we were climbing until we have to be out of the icefall at eight o'clock, the latest when the sun rises and it gets really hot in the icefall because we are very close to the equator. So during the days, the temperature rose. Ro- will rise to 25 in base camp and up in the western Kuhn, which, which is the valley going into it was like it was hell it was so hot so you had to try to get through the western Kuhn before the, the sun was rising because then when you were sweating so lot you were losing liquid and you need a lot of liquid in your system so you we were just climbing during the night So that was fun on the north side we didn't have to climb during the night because there's no unstable ice fall you could climb do your climbing and trekking during the day, <laughs> which is more fun. <laughs> so they're actually, the climate is changing a lot. Uh, I understand it's uh, changing up there. It's very, but I uh, always thought it's very cold, but I never actually understood that it might get so hot as well. That's, I think I've been sweating more on these mountains than it's actually been. The cold is during the night. It gets really cold. And then just before the sunrise, that's the coldest. Every mountaineer knows. Like, if you get to the sunrise, you're like, you're okay. You you will manage. But like a few hours before sunrise is the worst. That's that's the cold, cold time there. Because we're so high up, like, so the sun will be very warm. It's different from hiking in, in Lapland when it's raining. You might be cold and miserable for a week that's much that's worse than doing climbing <laughs> how do you cope with the cold you said that just before yeah. the sunrise mm. it's very hard it's, yeah have you learned more during your climbings or is it natural for you yeah you learn to suffer <laughs> <laughs> you've been ice skating where you were a kid with all these ladies sky skates you know what suffering is <laughs> No, you get you get used to it. I mean, the equipment is getting better and better all the time. But still, my hands get very cold. So I usually use my breathing. That's when I use my mm. breathing. When I'm really cold, I'm just kind of, okay, we're just going to manage. And then I break down the time again to small pieces. I go like, okay, I'm going to move from here to there. And then I'm going to breathe again. And then I'm going to move again. <laughs> Or sometimes I did like, okay, I'm going to count to 18. I'm going to take 18 steps. And then I get to stop. Like, <laughs> Then I get to rest. I kind of reward myself. Like, I, I break it down to small pieces. And that's how I managed through the cola. So I was, uh, last July I was climbing in Peru and we were climbing Artasara, which is, it was really cold wind. It was like freezing. And we had these small, small steps we could stand up when we were, waiting for the next one to, to use the rope because that's not, you cannot climb individually. You're on the same rope and we have to secure it. I was standing there. I was freezing. I was like, I want to turn around. I like, I'm so cold. I never been this cold. And then I could see like the sun, like the first rays of sun rifle. Like, hey, no, you know, it's not going to last forever. It's not. <laughs> so yeah, it's a mental game. That's a mental game when you know, like, okay. This is not, you're not going to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Can yeah. I still have my ten fingers? <laughs> oh, I, I can see that. I think you, you might miss yeah. one, but no, no, no. <laughs> they are still a whole there. Yeah, yeah, that's the mental game. It sounds like it's mm. really a mental mm. game. Have you ever had a point that you felt like you're not going to make it? Mm. Probably mm. I have. <laughs> It's something you tend to forget. It's probably like childbirth. <laughs> I don't think women, I don't have children, but I can imagine like <laughs> you think you're going to die and you're still going to have another kid. But yeah, I think I had nights like we were climbing through the night. And when I said Everest was really smooth, yes, during that night I do. I had one point my oxygen wasn't working. The pipe got kind of I stuck in it because you have your breathing air, you have liquid coming in there, it might freeze up. And I was like, I was getting less and less and less. I didn't realize like it was frozen up. I was like, then my friends like, you're not moving anymore. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I don't think now everything is all right. <laughs> then I realized to, to, to break the ice and I got some more oxygen and then my brain started to work again. So I think I, at that point I was like, no, this is not going to like, this is not going to work like <laughs> <laughs> I had to turn around like this is not working. <laughs> and I think on Choyo, I had at one point, I was like, no, no, this is not going to. It was when we were acclimatizing. I was I was hardly moving like up. And you can see, you were talking about these people like going in line and just hanging on the rope. Like you can yeah. see these people like they're not moving like. And they're, yeah. So yeah I think this is something that happens. Yeah, them. it happens. Yeah, you can see that. You know, the climbers, when there's a lot of climbers on busy routes, like, okay, that's one is not moving anymore. That you should go down because there's, yeah. he doesn't have enough. <laughs> and <laughs> you don't realize it yourself. No, you don't. At all. No, no, you might not. You might not. And on other points, like, you do have the strength, you do have the effort because. The, people, the human mind and the body is funny like when you think you're finished like you're not going to move another step you still have a lot you still have a lot to give and you just have kind of pushed through that one <laughs> like yeah I'm going to the next level <laughs> I think people who uh, do like exercise a lot like do this I, I call them like this wolf training when you have to run uphill for instance you run like You think you're going to throw up. You think like you have blood in your mouth and you, you think, oh, I'm still going to push one more. <laughs> It's pretty much the same. <laughs> you like working out and you've been mm. in a good physical condition before you started climbing. Mm. Was it still surprising how heavy it actually is to go up? Or mm. was it something that you already were able to expect? I, I kind of knew, but you, you can never imagine what it's like. Because it's not the exercise in itself, it's the lack of oxygen, which makes it, which makes it so hard. I mean, I told people, like, people told me, like, why do you want to pay all this money? You could just go to Malminkartan and put a plastic bag on your head. <laughs> it would be pretty much the same. I'm like, yeah, it might, it might feel the same. <laughs> it's not the same. Like, so it's not actually the fit. Because if you look, like, on the kilometers and, uh, and, uh, The vertical meters as well. Mm. If you do them on sea level, that's nothing. That's like, I've been asked, like, why do you spend two months climbing a mountain that is like eight, nine kilometers? Like, you just go up and you come down. But it's <laughs> not, it's <laughs> like, you can't move that fast. You can't, you can't do anything fast. I mean, going to the toilet is an effort in the beginning because before you acclimatize, before your body has like realized that they're not getting any more oxygen. It's like an effort just to move like short distance and you feel like you're like 95. <laughs> and it's a funny feeling in your body when you're like everything is a big effort. I remember the first time I flew into Laza, which is a really high airport. It's two and a half, almost three kilometers. And I just took my heavy backpack. I mean, take my heavy backpack. Yeah. And I just walked down to, to the waiting car. I was like, I think I'm gonna die. Like <laughs> I, I felt like I can't move. I I can't. So you have to feel it. It's not something you can really kind of relate to anybody before you <laughs> felt it yourself. <laughs> What about you as a mountaineer? Have mm. you or how often you have taken risks risks that mm. you later on 
think about like, okay, this was maybe a bit too risky. Has it happened to mm, you? Yeah, it has happened. You may you might not realize it at the time, like or even like yeah. I don't think I realized how big a risk it was to be in the ice fall actually before I was there. And then I just realized I just had to do it because I had to get out of it. And now later on I realized with all the earthquakes going on like what a really big risk it is. I mean, if the earthquake when the earthquake hit, as it hit, the place that was destroyed, like totally destroyed, was the place where we used to have our camp. So we're talking about like, okay, we were lucky. We were really lucky. Yeah. And then sometimes you have to cross places where they're like loose rock coming all the time mm-hmm. and you just kind of have to be very fast <laughs> and be lucky. So later on you thought, mm, it wasn't a very good choice. But I think, yeah. Probably I've been lucky too. You reached the summit from the north mm-hmm. side. You don't have to go through that uh, ice fall. Ice fall then? No. 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 Okay. Was that one reason you took the north yes. route? Yes. <laughs> it was one of the reasons I uh, I didn't want to do when I go mountaineering. Uh, I don't have like I have to do these certain mountains like. I like to do new mountains all the time because it's interesting. Hmm. Summiting, yes, it's really important and it's fun, but it's not the main point. I don't think, I still don't think that's, I'm not going to go back to Choyu just to reach the summit. Like, that's not going to, I'm not going to do that (laughs) because I don't think that's the idea. So when I was, after lots, I was, I was just kind of realized that uh, I was offered a chance to climb from the north. and it historically, it's really interesting because that's where the, the British tried to climb in the first time. Mm. Because before the Chinese then took over Tibet and, 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 uh, they were not allowed to go there anymore. So they were, and before that, Nepal was closed because the king of Nepal and then the king of Nepal opened Nepal. So that's, it's actually an accident that it was climbed from the, because the first time they make the recognition, they thought like this uh, ice fall looks like hell, like, this Western Coombe, no way, nobody can climb this southern. They were trying from the north. That was the like logical way to climb Everest, but they didn't succeed before they succeeded on the south side. So I think historically it's interesting yeah. that they they went there before. But does it make mm-hmm. any sense to you that this south side is more accessible? That people really mm-hmm. use that side, or it's because east the north mm-hmm. one. Far more, uh, well, there's not hmm. this uh, danger zone, but this is more mm. difficult. Then. It's considered more difficult, yes, because you're up in the exposed death zone for a longer period of time. It's very exposed, it's very cold. Okay. And once you hit the North Cole and you go up, go up like you can see the summits all the time, which I like. I think it's it's nice. But it's been considered, it's much colder. The whole expedition is much colder because we're so much higher up. Because okay. when you start from India, you go up to to Nepal and then you go up on the Tibetan plateau, which is very high in itself. So your acclimatization is not very easy. And then for your body to be that high for that long is not very good. On the Nepal side, we went down to get some more oxygen, to get more strength for our body bef- before the summits push which is not possible on, on the outside. Maybe in the future, when they fly with helicopters nowadays, if you have mm-hmm. a lot of money, you can, from base camp, you can take helicopter and go to Kathmandu and, and stay in a very nice hotel and get a lot of nice food and entertainment and just relax. And then they fly you back and you climb for the summit. I mean, it's different for just staying and eating potatoes and onions. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so many ways to climb a mountain. <laughs> yeah, but it's not real mountaineering. No. Mm. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't think it's so. It's different, but it, though. It's yeah. a different way yeah. of mountaineering. So, yeah, I think the north side was exciting because of the historical, and then I thought it was more straightforward. I could, I like to see the route. I like to see the, which was potentially dangerous. I like to see it like visually mm. when I start climbing, and I think the north side was more straightforward. But then you have you have the problems with the, the Chinese authorities. They might just say. 
we climb it? We close the borders and you don't climb. So when you prepare and you go like, oh. okay. So that's happened in, in, in the past because somebody did something then. This year, there was, we were only like 60 climbers because there was a lot of American climbers who just two weeks before be, were be denied visa because um, Obama met with Dalai Lama. So there might, this is politics and sometimes gets confused with mountaineering. <laughs> okay. Why is it called exposed death zone? Because it's uh, above 8,000 meters where there's not enough oxygen okay. to sustain life. That's pretty much. Okay. So if you stay there for an extensive period without a supplementary oxygen, you're, you're going to die. Your body is just going to shut down. Okay. That's why it's called the death zone. What do you think about people? A lot of climbers do it without mm. supplementary mm. oxygen. Mm. Why is that? Some people think consider it like not really mountaineering to use the supplementary oxygen. Mm. So they think only if you can do it without, that's real mountaineering. Which is kind of funny because the first summit was done with oxygen and for a long time they thought it wasn't possible for the human body to be without like supplementary oxygen. It wasn't before Messner climbed without supplementary with Hubbler that he, they realized that it's possible. So there's mm. no roots, historical mm. roots for mm. that without supplementary oxygen. No, it's just no, somebody after, invented no. it. Really strong climbers do not do it. It's not impossible. They, they, but a lot of climbers who've done it, they, they died on the way down. Mm. So it's a, it's a very big risk. And, and as I told you about the the to get frostbite, the chance mm. of getting frostbite is really big. And then because Everest is so crowded, you cannot stand in line if you're without supplementary oxygen because you get so cold. So that's the the crowds. They need to climb at a time when there's no other climbers and that's when the weather is not visible again. So that's a real problem. We had a few on the, on the north side who didn't succeed the year I was there because there was a very small weather window and all us <laughs> tourists with supplementary oxygen yeah. was there on the route at that time. So they, they were not able to climb there. Okay. When you reach the summit, finally, Mount Everest, the highest mm -hmm. mountain in the world, top of the world, mm -hmm. so-called, mm -hmm. you saw something different that not many climbers actually see. There was nobody on the south side. It was mm -hmm. empty, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What yeah. was that? It was because there was the accident in the icefall that spring. There was parts of the, we call it the horseshoe. It's an ice buildup just above the the ice fall and it fell down and killed 16 Sherpas so that's why they, they didn't close it officially that's later news but uh, they didn't rope the ice fall doctors who usually rope the ice fall they didn't rope it that year so there was no climbers so we were the only climbers and because the border was shut from the American climbers we were very few climbers that year I think if you look at the Himalayan Trust record I think we were only 60 climbers that year, which yeah, you can say it, the the circumstances are not very <laughs> no. kind of nice, but it was a treat, of course. When I was on the summit, there was the Chinese team, which always climbs first, and we were then the first non-Chinese to reach the summit. And yeah, I don't think it takes away anything from my summiting that uh, mm. We were very happy about the summit anyway. <laughs> yeah, and I was thinking it mm. might have been nice that mm. it's mm. not so crowded. Yeah, maybe. If there would have been like from the south as well, like 100 climbers, it might not. Usually on the south side, they they, climb, they summit earlier in May. Because on the yeah. north side, it's so cold. We usually go there a little bit, a little bit later. But there's no use to... I mean, you can summit traditionally like the historical summits were in June still. And if you think like this, start now summiting like 10th of May, that's very, very early. And now just this is funny, this, they just started to go for the ice fold just, I think, yesterday, got to the base camp to start working on the ice fall for this spring season already. I think it's getting earlier and earlier all the time. Okay. Tell me about the sky. In the mountains. I went to this virtual reality and I kind of want to know if it's real. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I never seen this many stars, even though it was the <laughs> roof of this uh, mm-hmm. shop. Mm. But how is it up there? It's is it different than it's here? It's very different. We don't have these light pollutions in the mountains. Well, you can go anywhere in the mountains. And you see the stars. I mean, you can go up to Lapland and you see the stars, but mm-hmm. you're very high up, so you see, like, the Milky Way is like nowhere else. And it's beautiful. And sometimes I just take my sleeping bag and I, I, I put my head outside and I just watch the stars. It's like, it's huge. It's, it's so big. It's, and when you, when you climb during the night, you can see them as well, even if you have your headlamps, of course, but, but, it's uh, it's like no place else. It's beautiful. Is this a one big reason that you are climbing up there? Maybe it's one, yeah. <laughs> what because, else? Because, Why? What takes mm, you up? One reason is that you feel very small when you're up on the mountain. I mean, the nature is so big there, especially when the big mountains. Like you feel like I'm nothing, and we're nothing in the universe. Mm. <laughs> so. Which, in a way, like empowers you still, like, okay, I can still be here if I'm nothing. <laughs> so being out in a mountain, I like to, to walk there, like I said, sometimes mm. fall behind. And and uh, even if you're, you're walking in a group, a lot, a lot of time we don't talk, we just walk. So I say, like, people who say, like, okay, I have all these problems at home and I want to get away from them. That's not a very good thing. Because you have to be like a very good friend to yourself because you're going to spend so much time with yourself. So you better like, but you get to do a lot of thinking, which I think, and you don't have all this disturbance. We have so much things like disturbing you all the time. So I find that very peaceful. Some people call it like, like physical yoga. Like you'd really get to think about like big stuff. (laughs) Sort of meditation, I, I well, suppose. Like meditation, yeah. It's like you do a lot, like I've done the the walks in in Europe as well, and and I really enjoy it. Like after four or five days, you go like body loves like five o'clock, like oh, let's go walking, and it's really fun when your your thoughts like start to just move around when you're not like. It takes three or four days to empty your head from this everyday of like pollution <laughs> before you get to think about like big stuff. <laughs> but I enjoy it. <laughs> you seem like a very happy person and it seems like I meet you the first time and mm. I, I kind of get an, I sense that you don't stress about little things and little details. Have you <laughs> always been like that or am I getting it all wrong here? <laughs> No, it's because I get to, to kind of talk about the thing I love. You okay. should see me at home or, <laughs> or at work. <laughs> different me <laughs> there. Probably a very different one, yeah. <laughs> we live very busy lives like all people in the Western world. I think we have so much, many things that disturb us, like 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 not important things. like, And we make them like to be big things. And when you're out in the nature, like these very basic things like being warm, Staying alive, get your food. These are like important things. And I try to take that with me when I go back to my everyday life. I, I try to be really grateful for the things I have. And I, it's a lot easier for me when I get back from the mountains to just, you're really grateful from water coming from the, the tap. Like hot showers is like, wow. <laughs> Going to the toilet is like, wow. <laughs> Unfortunately, you tend to get forget that. But I try to like be really grateful for small things and, and for the people around me. <laughs> you think people here should understand it more, be more mm. grateful. What we have, we mm. have it very well. Oh, we have everything. Like, yeah. That's what I said in the beginning, like the Nepali people who just most of them have nothing. But sometimes, some, a lot of things, times I think they're much happier. And I've tried to kind of find out why, because they have very hard lives. But it has something to do with being grateful for the things you have. And that's a really hard lesson to learn. I'm just on my way, like very short, but I, I try to work on it. How often do you visit Nepal? Is there any planning now going on? Mm, I would really much try to go there next fall, but I don't, I don't think my, my work situation is going to allow it. My, but I'm going to keep on hoping and... 
I haven't been there in a few years. I've, the last two years I've been in, in Peru climbing as well. Yeah. And they're mountain people as well, but they're different mountain people. But I would like to go back to Nepal, and I would like to go to Pakistan as well. That's that's my big dream, okay. that one day I might, I might climb there. But the political situation still is very unstable there. There, there's been very unfortunate. There was a few years back. There was a, a base camp shooting, where the Taliban went and shot yes, people. Yes, I know about that. that. Yeah, yeah. So see. these are kind of extra risks. I'm, I'm not ready to take. I can, mm. I can work with the environment and all this, but not to get this <laughs> involved in their politics. Yeah, the external mm. risks. Mm. I no, maybe mm. not. Yeah, maybe not yet. Yeah, yeah let's see. Maybe not maybe. a good idea. Yeah, I'm not getting any younger, so it might be a trek to the Baltimore Glacier. <laughs> <laughs> what about Peru? How is it different than Nepal? Himalayans uh, and what's in uh, Peru? Uh, per- Peruvians, they are Peruvians, like, yeah, okay, you know, yeah. They are descendants of the Incas, and uh, for that, they still live up in the mountains. Yeah. I've been climbing in, in in close by to Huaraz in the Cordillera Blanca, which is oh, uh, that's fine. It's like a playground. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, there's for a, you, I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> it's from, but it's still like if you know Chamonix in in in, in Europe, then I think there's the Chamonix of, of Peru is is, is Huaraz. Yeah. and I think a lot of the Finnish people know about Huipuing. It was there climbing, so if you know the surrounding of yeah. what they did there, so it, it's wonderful. The city, you, everything is close. I mean, the the city of Huaraz should take like four hours by the car. You you're in the entrance to the valley. You trek one day day up to the base camp. One day up to high camp, you summit the six five thousand meter peak. You go down to base camp, climb the next one, and wow. that's a lot of fun. Yeah, you can do biking and riding or whatever. <laughs> it's like a really outdoor mecca. <laughs> you make it sound so easy. Just go up at the six thousand and come down and go next day back. Mm. And they have it's wonderful crazy. treks there as well. I think they yeah. probably have the most beautiful. It's a subtropical mountain range, so it's it's quite warm. So you don't have to them have that much like clothing and food and stuff. And because they short trips, then you can come, go back to her rice and have a nice hot shower and eat a nice meal and have a glass of wine. <laughs> but not helicopter. <laughs> no, they don't fly helicopter. No, I don't think so. Not even. No. <laughs> <laughs> How do you choose your mountains? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the mountains choose me. I'm pretty sure. I stumble up. On them in some somebody's been somewhere or somebody's telling stories or I read about them or books whatever. I mean, Artes and Rahu has been. It's the mountain on Paramount Picture, the, the, their logo. Yeah. And I think the first time I, I was even thinking about Peru, I was like, mm, this would be. But it, it's very dangerous uh, or technical mountain, so I wasn't ready for that. And then of course people climb Alpamaya, that's the, very close by. Yes, people are more familiar because it was chosen the most beautiful mountain in the world. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a beautiful mountain, but there's so many mountains. It's it's like a playground. It's like, so, yeah, there's so many. So I think the mountain chooses me, <laughs> not the other way around. <laughs> How much do you follow your guts when it comes to, well, mountains mm-hmm. choose you mm-hmm. or when you are making the decisions up there in the mountains mm-hmm. that maybe this is not a good idea to change? Uh, choose this route or now I need to go down I can't mm-hmm. reach the summit how much you follow follow your guts your instincts I think pretty much they say women have the sex sixth sense <laughs> yeah that's what they say <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think it's it's pretty much all a gut thing of course you have to kind of think about it but I follow my instincts very if it doesn't feel right I don't go Because I don't have to. That's a good thing, not having sponsors. I think that's a lot of pressure on those who have. It's, you can't really go, mm, this doesn't feel so good, yeah, but you promised to go. <laughs> so, yeah, I feel my... I I do, because I only do, do this for fun. So <laughs> uh, It's, yeah, I follow my God pretty much <laughs> every time. <laughs> What makes me a unique mountaineer? What is unique about you if we compare to the other mountaineers who are reaching the summits? I'm a Finnish woman. (laughs) (laughs) 
What makes me unique? I don't know. I think everybody, every single mountaineer is unique in a way. But I don't feel special in a way that I think. Is there, is there a different way of thinking when you're part of this group? You, mm. I've been climbing with different groups. Mm. Do you see there that you have a different way of thinking than maybe the other climbers? Yeah. Climbers are usually kind of very strong personalities, which it takes to go out there, to just mm. kind of, to just go out there, yeah. <laughs> usually takes. And... Um, As a team, hmm. we're very different. I, I, I couldn't even tell you if you asked me to like, what's a prototype for a climber? Mm -hmm. I don't think I, I don't think because I've been climbing with so different people. Some, some are very quiet and like don't make a big noise of them, and some climbers are like, I'm here, <laughs> see me, hear me. They take over the whole team, and and they're. And then, of course, it's always an international team. So, so those who don't speak English as their first language, they usually kind of fall behind a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I'm usually I'm quite quiet. I think compared to a lot of climbers, I like to observe. I do it in my everyday life as well. I'm more like an observer. But I've been told that I pitch in a lot. Okay, it might have to do with my work again, but yeah. <laughs> or the Finnish upbringing, because they say like, yeah, I'm the one who always pitches in when there there is a need from, and somehow I, I tend to be like they tell me like the mother figure. I don't know about that, but I tend to be the nurse as well. <laughs> okay, <laughs> taking care because you know when men get this men flu, then they're really sick. <laughs> Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, I realize when they get sick, they get really sick. They need a lot of attention. So I do tend to give them. <laughs> I'm kind of compassionate in that way. <laughs> Sometimes I think about myself like, Mia, this expedition, you don't care, gonna care about anybody. You're just gonna go for the summit and you don't care. You're not gonna hand out any medicine. You're not gonna give any. Sympathy, you're just gonna go for like go, and every time like it's not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've been medicating somebody on all the trips, <laughs> but uh, I think that's a good thing, probably. <laughs> What about your expedition groups? Yeah, bet there are some macho guys. Mm -hmm. Do you have to tame them? Do you see that they're trying to take two big risks that you need to calm them down a little bit? Yeah, you can say it, but it's gonna kind of bite them in the ass at one point. <laughs> you know that. Mm. I mean, the more you climb, the more you get experienced. And if there are like, they usually, those who are not experienced, they go too fast. And if even if you tell them like, don't go so fast, it's not gonna, they do it anyway. Mm. I don't usually kind of, no. I usually let them to find out for themselves yeah. if they're not gonna kill themselves. <laughs> but, Yeah, as an older climber, I do kind of, I think I'm probably more responsible, so I do tend to tell them, like, what's going to happen if they do something, this or that. Of course, I can't help it if they're going to do it anyway, but... <laughs> Maybe it's better to save energy for the climbing itself. Usually, yeah. I don't, I don't I've been to, asked a lot about that, what it feels like to be the, the woman on the team. But when we're up there, it's like, it's not that different, like... I, at least I don't feel it. Might be because I come from Finland, where we're kind of equal, pretty much in the society, and I'm. So they don't tend to like treat me like, oh, here's your chair, and. <laughs> so I think we forget the gender thing up there because there's so much kind of more important things to take care of. Talking about mm. saving energy, what are the best ways of saving energy? I bet you've learned a lot. Mm. this up in the mountains when the climate is so thin mm. I think don't get sweaty that's really hard when the temperature goes like from ice cold really warm because then you lose a lot of energy you use a lot of liquid and the Sherpas use that a lot they go like they carry heavy loads so they're they try not to get sweaty because then you don't get cold 
Mm-hmm. That's one. It, it sounds very easy and like basic, but that's one. And the other one is that uh, you're not really in a hurry anywhere until you go for the summit bit when you need to go like up and down as fast as possible. So that's, maybe, I mean, the day is going to be this long anyway, <laughs> even if you run there like you know, three hours. And usually we have like on the north side the, the tents and the food and everything was transported on yaks. So why run up to base camp when there's going to be nothing? You're just going to wait for them. So, yeah, and pretty much save your energy everywhere. And then I have one rule. Every, every time there was food or drinks, I was always there <laughs> mm. in camp because I don't like to carry a lot of food and drinks. So I try to kind of store up. When it was uh, like, before we leave from the tents, I drink a lot of liquid so I don't have to carry it. How important it is to live in the moment when you are mountaineering? Not thinking mm-hmm. about that reaching the summit mm-hmm. or the past that mm-hmm. something maybe happened over there. It's very important. Your, your life might depend on that. You really have to concentrate on what you're doing right now. I mean, are you placing like PCs for, for safekeeping or roping up or doing whatever? You have to be really careful with what you're doing and you really have to, to be in. I don't think about anything else when I'm climbing. Is yeah. it, if I'm ice climbing, if I'm rock climbing, whatever, you just, that's, that's what's so great about it. I mean, if you lose your concentration for a minute, you're just going to fall down. <laughs> so, yeah, that's really living in the moment. Have you been able to use that mindset that you learned when climbing here in the busy city? It has something to do with that being grateful to live in the moment, to just try to like be really happy about things you have right now and not... I used to be, and I still am a bit of a worrier, like, what's going to happen? And then I, I build all this, like, oh, which is in a way is a good thing. But on the other way, why worry about things that it's not going to happen? <laughs> so I, I, this is, I work, I work really hard on this to, to try to, to be in this moment. Like, now I'm here with you. I'm not like thinking about all the things I have to do at home or, or all the things I did yesterday or why didn't I yesterday do things like this. Then I I really try to, okay, this is now how it's going to work and then we take the next step. It's the same. I try to, like, very difficult things for me, I, I try to break them down in small pieces. Like, So when I have this much things at home to do or for work or something, like, okay, I do this thing. And then I do the next thing. And then I do the next thing. <laughs> this is, I know, this is a very simple way. But it's not so simple when you try to do it in your everyday life. <laughs> yeah, I understand mm. that. I'm trying to learn myself mm. now. Mm. Nowadays a lot. Mm. Living in the moment. Mm. But I still tend to worry about mm. things. I've learned a lot. But today was a good mm. example. We we planning to meet here at 12 o'clock. <laughs> and I was... I had it in my calendar, it's three o'clock, and I was like preparing myself for this conversation. It meant a lot, a lot to me that you come to talk to me and share your time. And then I just see this email. Yeah, I was sitting here for half an hour, and now I went home. Like, what happened? So then I started worrying. I was talking to myself in the car, like, it doesn't help to get worried. Mm. Just uh, calm down, and this is the situation now. You can't do anything for the past, but still, it kept coming to me like, "Oh, I'm gonna miss this interview," and I was so I was so mad to myself, <laughs> and I was so worried. I sent you emails, but then I'm able to get your phone mm. number from the registers, and mm. uh, then this you mm. happy and cheerful <laughs> person answers the phone like, "Okay, it doesn't matter," and uh, just you know the rock. <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> fell down I was thinking oh, okay life is not that bad so I didn't have to worry about that much but it's no. not very easy <laughs> usually people are much nicer than you actually think <laughs> yeah that's true yeah, I used to worry like even calling people I didn't know I was really like nervous excited I didn't want to do that but then I realized like oh, put your face on it and like do it in small pieces and, and it won't kill you like if it's not going to do like and that's when you learn on the big mountains, like small things don't really matter. <laughs> mm. It's the big things. <laughs> mm. 
if some of the listeners would like mm. to start mm. mountaineering, mm. is there any hint, any tips for them to give here? A couple of maybe? A couple of things. How you to start? Re- yeah, you really have to like love the outdoors. You lean you to be outdoors and small things can't matter like going to the outdoor toilets for instance like that's a big thing for a lot of people <laughs> not for us Finns I know but but uh, I realize that's a big thing and then um, do trekking start with mountain trekking I think that's good and then take an ice climbing course try out what it is what it feels like and then try out with a small mountain I think if you hate it then go for the big ones because it's not going to get any easier <laughs> like, yeah. uh, because you also have people going for Everest and, and they hate it like for two months. But they, it might be a really nice experience if you get used to it. Like you train probably your mindset is right and, and you have the proper like training for it. Do, do courses like meet people who do it, go out with people who do it and experience. And I mean, you don't need big mountains in the beginning. You can just go like in Lapland we have. Or oh, some people might not call them mountains, but you can climb in the Alps. You can do mm. trekking in the Alps. That's easy. It's low access. It's not dangerous. You don't need to. Don't go out on the glaciers before you have glacier training. And then take glacier course. Yeah. That's what I would recommend. <laughs> it's good stuff. Mm. It's crazy here that people just hated the two months they were up there. Probably it's the ego mm. then that. Puts yeah. them, I'm going to reach Mount mm. Everest and mm. then I can brag about it and tell people. Maybe. Yeah, if that's something you want to tell on the cocktail party, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> and if you want to suffer for it for two months, that's fine. But it might be a very nice experience if you have the right mindset and you train for it. And you meet all these beautiful people, all these wonderful people, all these very different, crazy people. <laughs> that's a really nice p- part of it. <laughs> How important do you think it's enjoying life, make the life joyful, do the things you love, mm. you love nature, you mm. like climbing. Mm. That's your goal to do that, to make you feel better. How important do you think that is? Because a lot of people mm. here in the cities around the mm. world are mm. actually pretty much suffering. They hate their jobs and they mm. sort of hate their life. What's your message to these people? I think it is important. I mean, we talk about happiness, happiness. I think happiness, it's important. But I don't mean happiness with like you're content all the time. That's mm. not happiness. It's not the same thing. Like you all just get to do the things you you love or you like. I think you need to suffer in between. I think that's important for the human mind in somehow the mindset. But I think if you're really unhappy with something, change it. I don't mean like leave your job, just get to another mindset about your job. I mean, I haven't always loved my work. That's no secret. (laughs) But if you're going to continue it, you have to change your mindset. You have to change, like find the happy things about them, the things you can accept and uh, live with that. And if you you can't change that, then you have to kind of change your work or, or change something else. Like uh, sometimes I have people say, oh, it's easy for you to go climbing. You don't have children. You don't have anybody to care about. And say like, okay, yeah, you have, but you choose to have children. And if you have them, you have to take this mindset. Okay, I can still take the time to do, I mean, you can still go outdoors with the kids and you have to take like baby steps again. You can, I mean, you don't have to go to the Himalayas. You can go, we have very nice national parks just close by. You can take the bus out. And you're out in the nature. You can enjoy that. You can go, you can go climbing. We have a lot of rocks in Finland to go climbing on. <laughs> we have a lot of ice falls. It's not the big things. It's the small things. And, and as I said, be grateful for the small things you have. How many Finns are grateful for having tap water, clean tap water? Not many. You travel a little bit outside Scandinavia, and you're really grateful for clean tap water. Hot showers in another thing, like clean maybe. sheets and towels. Yeah, so try to be grateful for like like small things and then try to f- change your mindset because you can do that. That's we're wonderful as people. We can change our mindset. <laughs> Animals can do it, but we can do it. So that's, I think that's the way to, to be more happy. I don't say that absolute happy, but be more happy in your everyday life. I think that's how you can achieve anything. 
And I always thought it was kind of corny when people said, you just have to put your mind on it and then you can do anything. <laughs> but if you really think about it, if you change like small things, then you can change bigger things. And I don't say that everybody can climb Mount Everest. I don't say everybody can be whatever they want, but they can do small changes in their lives. Beautiful words. Mm. I'm very mm. grateful to have you here and I'm... Thank you. Very grateful that I actually started this podcast because I've been okay. able to meet persons like mm. you. You are a courageous woman. You are. <laughs> you. I, I love your mindset. Mm. This is something I can really, truly myself learn about a lot. I thank, thank you. you very much for coming here to share your time, <laughs> give you another opportunity after me messing up the schedule. <laughs> that was something. Oh, hey, thank you so much. So hey, thank you for having me. Yeah. <laughs> I have a couple more questions mm, sure. for you. Now, if you could get a phone to call you back 20 years back, mm. or the Mia 20 years mm. younger, mm. what would you tell her? Climb more. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. That's maybe one. If I could change, I would have started climbing when I was like 20. It would have been like, I, I sometimes thought like, oh, I would have been so good by now. <laughs> uh, yeah. 20 years is not that much actually, but yeah, I would have, I would have climbed more. <laughs> <laughs> you, th you think you were more prepared as a little bit older with your mindset mm -hmm. when you started? Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah. yeah. That's what they say, at least that. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. If I started out, they say when you're 20, I wasn't 20, 20 years ago, but... <laughs> But they say, like, you, you might do a lot of foolish mistakes being very eager. But on the other hand, I, I, think, I don't think it's nothing wrong to be eager to do, like, like you really want to do, put your mind on. But yeah, they say older ones are wiser ones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How do you see yourself now in five years? In five years? Mm. I hope I'm still climbing in five years, and I think I am. Maybe not 8,000 meter peaks. That's no secret. I don't think I'm going to climb another eight because it's, it's, it's a big sacrifice, like money wise, time wise. That's one. And, uh, you actually destroy your, your physical body because two months up there, you come back, like you have no muscles left. You have like, and it takes like six, to 10 months to build up to where you kind of left it <laughs> before you started training. So that's, that's, that's a hardship on your body. So I don't think I'm going to put it through that anymore. <laughs> Is it lack of oxygen or lack of supplies and nutrition while you lose muscles because you're yeah. working out the whole time, actually, the two I months? No, a lot of time we spend in the tent. If you, if somebody was clocking mm. us up there, a lot of time you actually spend like, uh, trying to recover from the last climb. So okay. if you, again, if I say like kilometers and vertical meters, we don't move that much. Mm. So if you would do that at home, it would be an effort, no effort at all. But the lack of oxygen, really. <laughs> that's, <laughs> but that's, that's why it's so difficult. <laughs> I mean, other, otherwise everybody would be doing it. <laughs> I suppose. Thank you so much for sharing your time, yeah, Mia. Thank you. It was okay. great to have you here. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs>